welcome to Virology Research Services, where we decode science and provide innovative solutions. What is a neutralization assay in virology, and how is it carried out? The neutralization assay is a lab technique that allows scientists to quantify the ability of molecules, most commonly antibodies, to inhibit virus infectivity by physically preventing entry. A molecule or antibody can block entry by binding to a virus and by doing so, prevent it from engaging with the cellular receptors and therefore blocking binding or fusion with the cell membrane. Alternatively, the molecule could bind to a cellular receptor rather than to the virus and still block entry in a similar manner. Or a molecule could bind to the virus and just destroy it. All these scenarios can be measured in a neutralization assay. Neutralization assays are mostly used to determine the neutralizing properties of purified antibodies or molecules, determine the effectiveness of a vaccine formulation, a study the humoral immune response of subjects exposed to either a vaccine or a natural infection. Whichever the sample or the application, a neutralization assay always involves the pre-incubation of a serial dilution of sample or control with a predefined amount of virus, the addition of this mix to the assay cells, and incubation for the time dictated by the type of virus and by the readout of choice, and finally data analysis and quality check. Let's dive into each of these steps in more detail. When working with the test samples, it is important to understand the nature of the article. Each sample, whether it is a purified antibody or serum, doesn't contain only the test article, but a variety of components that constitute what we call diluent or matrix. This can be an elution buffer for a purified antibody or cellular components for a blood sample. And it is important to know how these components interfere with the neutralization assay. For example, blood sample are unsuitable for a neutralization assay due to the presence of blood cells, coagulation factors, and the complement. Therefore, it is better to work with serum samples, which do not contain cells and coagulation factors, and to heat inactivate them to eliminate the complement components that may lyse the virus or the assay cells. For less known or characterized matrices, it will be important to perform some matrix interference studies to assess the effect of matrix interference on the assay. This is generally performed by spiking different concentrations of a control antibody into several dilutions of the matrix and comparing the neutralizing properties of such antibody relative to standard assay media. In addition to the test samples, in each experiment, it is important to run a series of controls. The importance of the controls in a neutralization assay cannot be underestimated, as they provide valuable information on assay reproducibility and assist with assay verification during assay development. Different types of controls should be included in a neutralization assay. The positive control, which is a serum, antibody, or molecule with known antiviral activity. The negative control, which is a serum, antibody, or molecule with no neutralizing activity. The virus-only control, which consists of untreated, infected cells, and which provides the highest level of infection with no inhibition. The cell-only control, which consists of untreated, uninfected cells, and which provides the 0% infection and therefore the background level. And finally, if needed, a matrix control in which cells, infected and uninfected in the presence of the matrix, are compared to cells infected and uninfected in standard assay media. It is important that both samples and controls are diluted in the correct way, in order to cover the full range of neutralization, from complete inhibition, 100%, to no inhibition, 0%. It is especially important that a 50% neutralization is reached. If this is not the case, sometimes the software will still provide an IC50 value, but such value will only be an estimate 
and will not be accurate. Therefore, the assay should be repeated in a more suitable range. Generally, between 8 and 12, threefold to fivefold dilutions are common to cover a broad range of concentrations, although others can be used. The choice of the starting concentration is also very important, both to select the appropriate concentration range and to limit matrix interference. Determining the optimal amount of virus to use in a neutralization assay is also critical. The amount of virus depends on the virus itself and on the assay read out, the latter determining whether the assay will be stopped shortly after viral entry in a single round infection or after multiple rounds of virus replication. Single round infections are common for certain reporter gene assays or for immunofluorescence assay where only protein expression by the incoming virus is quantified. Multiple round infections are common for cell death-based readouts or whenever multiple rounds of virus propagation are required to detect sufficient signal, for example, in a focus reduction assay. Generally speaking, assays relying on a single round infection require higher amounts of virus, while assays relying on multiple rounds of infection require lower amounts of virus. For each virus, the MOI must be optimized during the stage of assay development, as the amount of virus is critical for accurate assessment of antibody potency. Too much virus can saturate the system, compromising readability and potentially underestimating antibody potency. Too little virus and signal may be too close to the assay noise, leading to inaccurate reading or potentially overestimation of potency. To identify the sweet spot, different concentrations of virus within the assay linear range should be tested. The range of MOIS, at which the IC50 values obtained for the same control remain unchanged, constitute the sweet spot. Within this range, we will abide with the so-called law of mass action which ensures that we are operating at MOIs where the assay works only as a function of the properties and concentrations of the antibody and not of the amount virus. This optimal amount of virus is then incubated with each dilution of the sample or control, generally for 30 to 60 minutes, and then added to the assay cells, generally for as long as it takes for the assay readout to fully develop. As mentioned previously, if we will be looking at viral protein expression, we will be able to stop the assay at earlier time points. If we will be looking for virus-induced cytopathic effect, CPE, we will need to wait longer until cell death over multiple virus replication rounds. The choice of readout depends on the type of virus, on the instrumentation available in the laboratory, and on other criteria determined by the experimenter. After assay reading, we will have our data, which will reflect virus infectivity at different sample concentrations. These data are plotted in a neutralization curve, where the x-axis displays the log 10 of the sample concentrations and the y-axis displays the normalized percent. Neutralization, meaning that the raw percent neutralization will be compared relative to the cell-only control, 0% infection, and the virus only control 100% infection. The fitting that we should chose for the neutralization curve is a sigmoidal four parameters logistic regression curve, preferably with constrained top and bottom asymptotes, as this avoids overfitting and maintain the curve into a biologically meaningful range. This plotting will provide us with a sigmoidal curve. The slope of such curve is called hill slope and it generally ranges between 0.5 and 2 in neutralization assays. Although it is difficult to correctly interpret the meaning of such slope in a complex biological assay with multiple players, a hill slope higher than 1 will give us a steeper curve, which may be indicative of possible cooperative binding, and a hill slope lower than 1 will give us shallower curves, which may be indicative of negative cooperative binding. The most important information derived from a neutralization curve is the IC50, 
which is the concentration of test article at which 50% of neutralization is reached. Using the hill slope and the IC50 value, it is possible with a simple formula to calculate the concentration of sample corresponding to any other percentage neutralization. During or after the analysis, it is important to evaluate the performance of the assay. This is important both to determine if each run is valid and also to characterize the assay in deeper detail during the stage of assay development. All controls play a crucial part in assessing assay performance and validity, and together they allow us to perform statistical analysis on some critical parameters, including assay variability, robustness, dynamic range, sensitivity, and confidence intervals. Similarly, ad hoc assay setups and further statistical analysis can help define edge effects, a common problem in plate-based assay in which wells at the edge of a plate show systematically different signal than central wells, generally due to higher evaporation at the edge of the plate or to temperature gradients. Neutralization assays are powerful tools for measuring antibody function, but as complex biological assays involving multiple players, they're not always straightforward. From subtle technical choices to understanding what a curve is really telling, all details really matter. That's why we've developed a comprehensive course focused on this assay, designed for professionals, scientists, students, and anyone involved in virology, immunology, or related fields who wants to confidently set up, perform, and interpret neutralization assays. Drawing on our extensive knowledge and hands-on experience in developing and refining these assays, the course offers a step-by-step -step theoretical and practical framework to help you design, execute, and analyze a neutralization assay with confidence. The course includes around two hours of material, broken down into seven short videos, each one focusing on key aspects of the assay, from the theoretical foundations to troubleshooting. By the end of the course, you'll be able to approach and this assay with greater clarity and confidence and avoid some of the common pitfalls that can throw off your results. Explore our website or click the link in the description to learn more about this course and join us in a thorough examination of this powerful virology tool.